Okay, so um, welcome to this course. I said I'm going to initially start with this um, this short talk, just overviewing Archer Services as a whole, and to explain where this course comes from, and then I'll, um, I'll I'll do a bit more description of how it's actually going to work over the next few weeks. So um, you can reuse all this material. Um, the materials up on the website uh, in a number of different locations, and um, you can reuse it with appropriate um, um, acknowledgement. So um, just to, some of you will know this, but I just wanted to give a, a brief overview. Um, this course is given as part of the Archer service. Now Archer is the, the current UK National Supercomputer Service, uh, which is managed by EPSRC, Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council. And the hardware is supplied by Cray, um, and it's housed, operated, and supported by EPCC. Now we won't actually be using Archer itself for this course. We'll be using, a, um, it's a, I'll explain this. If you have signed up for an account on Archer, you won't be logging on to the main Archer system, you'll be logging on to a subsidiary system called the Data Analytic Cluster. I'll explain why that is um, in, in the future, but all the techniques you learn um, on this course are applicable to Archer and at any um, supercomputer or parallel machine around the world. As part of the support contract, um, we run the Computational Science and Engineering team, um, which was, uh, which is, and part of that, we, we do 72 days training per year at various remote locations around the UK, and we're just, trying to build an obstacle more of the online training, which is where this fits in. This is actually Archer. Um, it's a large cray machine, um, lots of, of large cabinets the size of a door. Um, you won't be using Archer today, but you can go onto Archer afterwards if you want to. I'll explain how to do that later in the course. What is EPCC? Well, we're um, the closest thing there is to the UK National Supercomputer Centre. We've been running supercomputer services for, for, for a long time. We've run since 1990, originally with the Edinburgh Parallel Computing Centre, but technically now we're just EPCC. We're an institute at the University of Edinburgh, and we've been running national parallel services since actually the first national parallel service um, um, since 1994. We've, run, we've been involved in most of the, the services, although the CSAR service around the turn of the century was based out of Manchester. Uh, that was actually a Cray machine. There's about 70 of us. The reason I put this down is um, um, you may want to go away from this course and think, well, that was interesting, but how do I work with uh, EPCC afterwards? And so at the bottom here, in terms of that, um, EPCC staff, in terms of research grants, just turn up as normal um, postdocs, research assistants. So if, if you did ever want to collaborate with us, it would just be a normal collaboration as if you're collaborating with any postdoc at any university. But we do a range of academic research and commercial projects and we also do a couple of uh, more substantial training courses. I've, I've noted there, I'm plugging our MSc and HPC which has been running for almost 15, over 15 years, so that's a full year um, uh, MSc, residential MSc. And we also run some online accredited courses as part of um, um, an online MSc course called the Data Science Technology Innovation Programme. I just linked them there. Uh, key Archer resources, well, these are um, the, the things you'll, you'll want to look at. You'll already have seen the training pages for where you are registered. All the material from the past courses are archived as well this material, along with videos. So we're recording this session. Um, so just to be aware that I think the chat is, we have a, a log of the chat or that? Yeah, we get a log of the chat messages uh, and, and any audio will be recorded, um, just so you're aware of that. Um, and documentation, you probably won't need to look at the documentation, um, but if you want to in the future, it's there. We also run a set of regular online tutorials, which are normally uh, single, like two-hour events as opposed to full courses. But again, you can find the details of that at that URL. Who am I? My name is David Henty. I'm in charge of training EPCC. That encompasses a lot of things. The MSC, we're also a Praise Advanced Training Centre, the Archer Training Programme, and, and online courses such as this. I also do some HPC research, mainly in sort of new parallel programming models and, and kind of things to do with performance and parallel scaling. Um, so actually, so these slides come from our normal face-to-face um, uh, -face course. Uh, please fill in the feedback form. Um, I guess we'll open this at the end of the four weeks. So those of you who register will get um, a reminder. We do appreciate feedback. Um, Good feedback is great, it makes us feel good about ourselves, and if there are any issues with the course, we'd like to know, because we, we take it very seriously. You can be that in anonymously if you want, and 
um, although you can read your details. Um, I'm plugging the MSc again there. This is our MSc students. Uh, we also run, this is coming back to the, um, the online MSc, we run a couple of online accrediting courses, one in called a practical introduction to higher performance computing, one called a practical introduction to data science, they form part of an umbrella, sorry, the part of a larger program called the Data Science, Technology and Innovation MSc. You can do them standalone if you want, but it, the details are all there. Uh, they're running, they run sort of January to June each year. Uh, we're running a supercomputing MOOC at the moment, so if you're more in generally interested in supercomputing, it started, um, but you can join um, any time. We're just in, starting in the middle of the third week. Uh, it's at futurelearn.com. It's completely free. They, they do plug trying to get you to pay for upgrades, which gives you some other access and a, and a certificate to go on your wall, but you can attend the course completely free. And that is a, a very conceptual look at uh, supercomputing as a whole. So it touches on things like message passing program, but it's not a programming course, it's at the conceptual level. And um, typically the, the future learning courses are there to, to promote engagement and talk um, chat amongst the learners. So they're, they're quite fun to do. During the course, you'll have, uh, those of you who have applied will have guest accounts. Uh, we normally say you should only be used in the classroom, but that's not the case here because they're identified with your name. So, so you're free to use them, you'll have access for the entire duration of the course the whole of February. So the idea is you've got time in between these sessions uh, to actually try the exercises. Um, after the course ends, that's after the end of February, uh, the counts will be, may or may be closed. Um, so please take stuff away from you. But all the, don't worry about the course material. The course material will be available um, forever for future references, but just be aware that um, if you have any programs and things you want to, to keep, you should take a copy of them. Longer term, um, if you want to get access to Archer, you can apply uh, for a research grant. If you apply for a research grant now, you'll actually be applying for access to the follow-on to Archer. But um, the quickest way to get access to Archer, and probably the simplest way, is to the Archer driving test, um, which gives you um, what in Archer terms is not many um, much CPU time. You get just over a thousand cows, kilo allocation units. But it turns out to, to be 80,000 core hours. That's like running on your laptop for about three years. So um, if you are interested in getting a longer term access to Archer with, a, with some CPU budget, you can take the driving test. And that's been, we've had many hundreds of people get access to Archer by that mechanism. And this, the funding course, this isn't relevant, this has ended now. We're coming towards the end of the Archer service, so this isn't quite so relevant. Okay, so uh, what I was gonna do now, I haven't given that talk, was to uh, just do a sort of an overview of the technology. So hopefully you can all see me and hear me, and hopefully you saw the slides there. I will be sharing various applications. So what I will do is I will, um, should hopefully be sharing now a browser window. So this is the this is the the home page for the course, which hopefully you've seen. So if you go to training and upcoming courses, which you'll already see, if you click on message passing program with MPI you'll come to this, this, this um, page. So um, the main point I want to make here is the timetable is here, and I've linked in the material PDFs from the timetable. So I've done the first two weeks, I'll put the other weeks up um, as shortly. Um, I'll cover this uh, um, during the course, but the exercises um, are available here. Um, it's a PDF which you can download. I've given you the exercise of the entire course. We don't actually cover, this is a sort of shortened version of the course in this format, so we're not going to cover everything, but I thought I'd give you the entire, um, the entire sheet. And if you want to do all the exercises, I've got a link at the bottom to material from previous runs, which in includes all the material. So um, that, that should be fine. Um, so that's the, um, that's the website there. Um, you should also be able to chat. So during the, um, what I'll do, I'll go, I'll stop sharing that. Uh, during the course, uh, you should be able to chat. So there's a, if you go to the, there's a chat window. So that's, I will sometimes type stuff in there. You should be able to type into the chat window and it'll go to everybody, which is a useful way 
I will try and maybe um, I'll try and keep an eye on that if you have questions. You can also raise a hand. So there's a there's a raise a hand icon. Um, okay, so somebody just raised their hand. And how do I see? Okay. So I can now see that Ben has raised his hand, and if I lower his hand, so that's a use. I get an audio and a visual um, a notification for that. So I mean, um, we haven't run. We we do a lot of online uh, seminars and such like. So, so we've used this technology to collaborate for delivering sort of tutorials and such like, and um, seminars quite a lot. Not used it in this format where we're going to mix both talk material and practical. So um, we'll have to see what works best. But there are kind of, um, you can ask questions via both chat and via audio. Um, you're welcome to try the audio. In the past, people seem to have liked the chat um, a bit more. Um, but if you type it directly into the chat window, hopefully I will notice it. But if I don't, then raising your hand will be a good thing to do. So if you raise your hand, I can then go to the attendee list and I will see whose hand is raised and I should be able to I would ask you um, something over audio or check the um, check the, the chat window in case I haven't um, I haven't seen it. Um, in terms of the practical sessions, well, I'll get back to that. I'll get back to that. So that was really the the overview. Um, what I was going to do now was just give the uh, the first talk, which is on message passing concepts, and that is um, a, I'll give that before we. Uh, so the plan is. You look at the timetable, I'll give a message passing concepts talk. Then, before the break, between half two and three, we will do a very simple practical compiling and running an MPI program. Now, this, I brought this slightly forward. You don't really know any MPI at the moment, or you won't even ask to the first talk, but I brought this forward so that if there are any technical issues due to access and such like, then we can um, we can cover them. Um, we can cover them uh, and have some time over the, over the interval to, to fix them. And then we'll come back. And we're going to be running half past one to five every day with a, a half hour break at, um, at three o'clock. Okay, so, so this first talk is going to be conceptual and it is a very, very important talk. Um, I know people are probably quite keen to get into programming and actually writing programs, but um, experience has shown that, um, it, that I've taught this course in, uh, many times that it's actually. It's actually quite easy to get a couple of days into a, or quite a way into MPI, and it turns out you don't really understand what's going on. So the message passing concept is really quite key to making sure you understand um, how, how message passing in MPI works. So I'll cover the message passing model. I'll cover something called SPMD, which is the way that MPI works. I'll talk a bit conceptual communication modes and collective communications, and we'll come back to all these things over the rest of the course, you'll, you'll find out how they actually work in practice, how do these things translate into MPI, but it's important to cover the conceptual level. So imagine, if you have for a moment, that this was a, a serial program course. That's not, I'm assuming that, um, that you're able to program already and you can do the exercises in, in C, C++ or Fortran. It is possible to do MPI from Python, although it's it's only recently become sort of standardized. If I have time, I may cover, give you some hints on that. But my assumption here is that you'll be using C, C++ or Fortran for the exercise. But if this was a course in serial programming, I would, I would be talking about three layers of things. If I was talking about serial programming, first of all, I would talk about concepts. I would talk about concepts which are generic to programming languages, things like the arrays, functions, control flow, if then else. And they are um, concepts which are um, independent of programming language. They're just general concepts. Okay, so these are concepts. And I might give a talk on what an array is, how control flow works, how compilation works. I might then say, OK, we've learned about these things, such as arrays and control flow. I'm going to pick a, a particular language. How do we do them in Python? How do we do them in Java? How do we do them in C, C++? How do we do them in Fortran? We might instruct them if then else. So that would be the actual languages. But then the third level is implementation. I might tell you, well, we're going to use C or C++, but then how do you actually compile a C program on this machine? You might use the GNU compiler, GCC, or you might be using the Cray compiler, Cray CC, or the Intel compiler, or the Portland Group compiler, or if you're doing Fortran, you might be using Cray Fortran. But there are three levels, generic concepts, a lot of languages that implement some or all of these concepts, 
and then particular implementations of those languages which are specific to particular computer or operating system or manufacturer. Now, the analogy for message passing parallel programming is I'm going to first talk about concepts in this talk, send, receive, collective groups, SPMD processes, which are generic to message passing programming. A message passing program is a way of paralleling, a way of um, thinking about parallel machines and a way of programming them. It turns out that message passing is almost always implemented in terms of a library, but you'll see here that there is only one library in this space, MPI. That's because almost exclusively people program message passing programs using the MPI library. And that's nice. See, if I was talking about pro serial programming, I might, you might say, well, then what language should I learn? Should I learn Python, Java, Fortran, C, C++, what's the best language? Well, for message passing, there's only one game in town. If you want to learn about message passing, you learn about MPI. That was not always true. If I was giving this talk 20 years ago, then there would have been quite a few um, uh, entries in this box, PVM, Parmax, uh, Make OCS tools, there have been other things here, but it's collapsed down to MPI, which is good. It means you don't have to learn more than one library. There are multiple implementations of these libraries, so we're going to be using something called OpenMPI. If you're on Arch, you use Cray MPI, you might use Intel MPI. So there, this is a library of which there are multiple implementations, but there is only one way of doing message passing. However, the mistake some people make is they dive, drive in this, and they try to learn MPI. MPI is good, but it's not perfect. It's important when you write an MPI program, you should really be thinking about how am I writing a message passing program, program what I want to do, and then how to implement that in MPI. Just like even if you're an experienced C Fortran programmer, when you're thinking about how to write something, you're not thinking about the, the syntax, you're thinking about what arrays should I use, what functions or objects should I create, and then you implement it in your favorite language. So that's why I want to give this talk. To a large extent, I shouldn't mention MPI in this talk. It's supposed to be a higher level message passing concept. So the message passing model is based on the notion of processes. What is a process? Well, a process is a program together with data. So if you write a program and compile it and run it, you have a program, or nowadays you might call it an application, it becomes an operating system process. And normally what you do if you want to write a program, you write it, you compile it, you run it, and it runs on your computer. MPI says, no, what you're going to do, message passing says, you're going to run multiple processes. So you don't run one program, you run more than one program. And the way that message passing works is it allows those multiple programs to talk to each other at runtime. And they do that by communicating by sending messages, which is what we'll talk about conceptually in this lecture. The important point is though, that each process has access only to its own data. When you run a program, the way that operating systems work, they're designed to, to, to ring fence processes to encapsulate them from, from each other. That's deliberate. Okay? If you're running Microsoft Word and you're running an Excel spreadsheet, for example, if the Excel spreadsheet has a flaky and does something wrong, you don't want it to scribble over on the memory of your, of your Word document. So the operating systems are designed um, to keep processes completely ring fenced from each other. And so um, the, the, the question there is, well, you've just told me I'm going to run multiple processes, which the operating system is doing everything in its power to keep separate, but you want them to talk to each other. How do we do that? Well, you do that through message passing. Message passing allows you to, to at runtime of different programs, different processes talking to each other. And that is done by sending and receiving messages. And we'll come back to this, but message passing is almost exclusively implemented through library calls but we don't have, you could, I mean, people did again in the early 90s invent message passing languages. They're very elegant, some of them. People hate learning new languages. People just don't like learning new languages. It takes a long time for a new language to take traction. I mean, Python is very popular now, but, you know, you know, it takes decades for languages to really come up and become popular. So message passing is done by extending conventional languages here, C, 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 C++, and Fortran with library calls. So the sequential paradigm is when you run, when you write a program and you run it, you think of your program running on a processor with access to the memory, and this is all wrapped up in a process. And it's wrapped up in a process that, that the operating system keeps your program um, separate from other ones. And in your mind, your program has exclusive access to the processor and to the memory. Now that may not be true in practice. Operating systems move your program around and you, you may get descheduled and, and, and sent off to 
you can stage off the disk and, and park for a while. But that doesn't matter. If this is your this is your model, when you write a sequential program, it's your model of what happens. And if you adhere to this model, you'll have a correct program. Parallel programming in in the, for, for message passing is exactly the same, except you run. Um, oops, I'm getting my cursor mixed up. You run multiple processes. Here I've run four processes. So what I've done is I've run four independent programs. I've labeled them 0, 1, 2, and 3, and it turns out that's how MPI labels them, which is convenient. And you want them to talk to each other. Now, how do they talk to each other? Well, the modern machine has some physical communications network. You will have lots of, um, we're not going to talk much about, about parallel architectures, but you'll have effectively lots of independent machines, lots of, of laptops, connected by wires, I don't have an ethernet or something. And you want potentially processes running on two different laptops to talk to each other. How do they do that? Well, there is a physical communications network underneath, but what a message passing library like MPI does for you is you don't care about this. You're given a way of sending and receiving data between processes, which is guaranteed to work, and to first approximation, you don't care what the communications network is, because it will just, it will just work for you. On Archer, if you load up Archer uh, Cray MPI, it will know how to communicate over the over the Cray network, and it's it's the same. The library course is the same. The implementation may be different. And this, the one of the reasons that message path has been so so successful is it maps onto distributed memory architectures very well. There's actually a picture of the previous service to Archer called Hector. We've got a slightly nicer picture of it. But the way that these machines work, in your mind, there are a bunch of processes with their own memory, each of these are individual computers connected by some interconnect. And we don't really care what this is on, a, on a, a, a departmental cluster. It might be Ethernet, which is relatively slow but cheap. On something like a Cray, it's a very expensive um, Aries network on, on, on Archer. And what we're going to do is we're going to run a program here, a program here, a program here, a program here, a program here. They're physically distributed, dif distinct machines with dis distributed memory. Each of these, think of these as each as a laptop, each with its own memory. But they can talk to each other over the interconnect. So MPI, message passing, allows us to take a process on this computer and for it to communicate with this process on this computer down here over the interconnect. So the way, how does process communication work? So what we imagine here is we've launched two programs which become two processes, process one and process two, okay? And process one has some program and it says A equals 23. And it's important that your model should be that process one is running on your laptop and process two is running on a laptop of a collaborator of yours in Australia, a long way away, okay? So your collaborator's memory is completely distinct from your memory. This is your laptop, this is your, your friend's laptop. And so A equals 23 of, uh, affects your memory. It says 20, A equals 23 in your memory. What you want to do is you want to send that data to the other process. So what you do is a typical message passing um, interface, a message passing library will give you a call. Here I've got just a generic class. I've got some magic call which I've called send. So this says I want to send, I want to send the data A to process two. Okay. So what this does is it does that the data is sent from process one to process two. Now, the important point is I said that these processes are ring fenced. And so all hell would break loose if you on your laptop in your office were allowed to scribble over the memory of your friend's laptop in Australia. And so this cannot actually transfer the data to, to, to your or the other processes memory. The analogy I've drawn here is drawn here is like sending an email. So what conceptually you should think of the message going into process two's inbox. So it doesn't actually go into the memory, it goes into the, into the inbox. And this is a good analogy because it illustrates a very, very important point about message passing. Message passing is a two-way process. For me to communicate with somebody, it's not enough for me to send a message. I have to actively send it. The receiver has to actively receive it. It's like if I send an email to somebody, sending an email to somebody does not transfer any information unless they read the email. So message passing is a two-ended process where the sender actively resends and the receiver actively receives. And so process two has to do something here, and what process, process two does is it issues a receive. It says, I want to receive some data from process one. And it's only at this point 
that the destination is decided. Process 2 is in entire control of its memory. So process 2 says, I want to receive the data that process 1 sent into a variable called B. So now B is equal to 23 on process 2. And now process 2 can do something quite innocuous. It can say A equals B plus 1. So its value of A is 24. And that illustrates that this idea that variables are private. You may have a variable A in your program, but because you've run two copies of the program, there are two variables A, one on process one and one on process two, and they can have completely different values. You may arrange them to have the same value, but in principle, they can have completely different values. So some of the things you really like to ask about in, in, in a typical programming, which is what is the value of A, become meaningless in message passing programming. You have to say, what is the value of A on process one? What is the value of A on process two? The other thing you can't ask is, what line is my program on? Because process one and process two are running independently. They can be at completely different lines in their programs. So that we'll see if that makes debugging message passing programs slightly challenging. But this is actually quite an important slide that does illustrate the, the, the um, major points that variables are local. So the, so the A variable on process one is totally different from the A variable on process two. The message passing is two-sided that requires a send and a receive. And you may ask what, ask what happens if I issue a send and there's no receive, what happens if I issue a receive and there's no send, we'll come back to all that later on in the course. The thing that makes things slightly confusing is something called SPMD. SPMD stands for single program multiple data, and this is the approach which most message passing systems take. Now, you could imagine in the previous slide, I said I had process one, process two running, running different programs. So you might think, okay, I write program one, I run it on, process, on computer one. I write program two, I run it on computer two. The problem with that is twofold. First of all, if I'm going to run on a machine like Archer, which has hundreds of thousands of CPU cores, I'm not going to want to run, write hundreds of thousands of programs. And secondly, in scientific and technical programming, most of the time, the programs are basically doing the same thing. If you think about weather forecasting, a standard way to do weather forecasting is to split the map of the Great Britain, for example, up into squares, and each pro a different processor simulates a different uh, section of, 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 of Great Britain. They're all running the same program. They're all simulating the weather. They're, running, they're using the same equations. They have different data. One will have the data for the northeast of the UK, one for the northwest, one for the southeast, one for the southwest. And so what we do typically in message passing is we use single program multiple data. We only write one program, but we run multiple copies of it. So we write one program, we might say, I want to run on 10 CPU cores, so please run 10 copies of this program. Each process has a separate copy of their data because they're running effectively on different computers, but you're running the same program. You then might say, well, wait a second, if you run the same program, don't they do the same thing? Well, they would, except you have access to one magic piece of information, which is who am I? So in this diagram I have here, I notice that the processes were numbered 0, 1, 2, and 3. So what you can do is, when you, when you're, you come up into existence, we'll see how to do this in MPI very early on, the first thing you ask is, am I pro what, give me my process number. So all these processes are absolutely identical, except they have different IDs. But once you know the ID, you can do different things. So you can actually follow completely different control flows for the program based on your ID. You can say, if my ID is 1, do X. If my ID is 2, do Y. So that's why SPMD sounds like a very uh, constraining model. Each, pro each process has to run an identical program. But once you've accessed this ID, which MPI calls the rank, you can do different things. Process can follow different control paths for the program depending on their process ID. We also usually one, run one process per processor core. We don't have to. Um, you can run modern computers um, are designed to run lots and lots of processes. Your laptop at any one time will be running hundreds, possibly, of processes, but you might only have two or four processor cores. Um, but in MPI, for message passing, we're interested in performance. And so you can run MPI programs running many more processes than you have physical CPU cores. That's very useful for developing in debug, it doesn't matter that your laptop only has two cores, you can run a 100 process MPI program on it if you want. However, your program won't go any faster. Once you're running two MPI processes on your two cores, that's saturating your physical hardware. If you run four MPI processes, it's very unlikely it'll go any faster. In fact, it'll probably go slower. So for high performance computing, we usually run 
one process per process of core, but that's not a restriction of the model, that's just because you're interested in performance. So again, I said that um, although every program, every process runs the same program, it's not a restriction, a standard model of message passing for paralyzing a program is called controller worker, we'll, we'll use that in one of the early exercises. You have a controller process that sends out work to lots of worker processes, they process it and send it back to the controller. So it sounds like you need two programs there, one which runs on the controller. So if you have n processes, you think that one of those processes would run the controller program and n minus one of them would run the worker program. But all you do in SPND is if you have more than one program, you just wrap up into a single program and call them functions. So in C, you know, you would just boot up and you would say, we'll see how to do this in NPI. If I'm the controller process, I call the controller, else I call the worker. So, you know, based on this value, which is your MPI call to the right, you can do completely different things. And in Fortran, it's just the same. Standard control flow in any program. So, I've talked a lot about messages, but I haven't really said what they are. Uh, a message transfer the number of data items of a certain type in the memory of one process, but not the other. And the thing which sometimes surprises people, especially if they're more used to more modern object object oriented programming, is that an MPI. A message passing in general, an MPI in particular, a message is quite a low level object. A message is 10 integers, 100 real numbers. Okay? It has other information around it. When you send a message, the message will contain most fundamentally the payload, which is the data. It will probably know where it came from, where it went to, how many data items there are, what type they are, maybe some additional message type identifier. But that's just sort of metadata. That in MPI, you should think of messages as being. A simple message would be a thousand real numbers. They're not, they don't map well into objects, or if you're an object oriented programming, and we'll come back to how MPI and C work together later on. But you can't send objects or classes or anything like that in MPI, you're sending 100 integers, 50 real numbers. That, that, that's the way it works. Now, I've used um, the model of, 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 of sending emails to, um, uh, to illustrate conceptually how MPI works. But even in everyday life, you can imagine that there are, there are, there are multiple ways of, of communicating with somebody. And, and a very good analogy is sending an email versus phoning somebody. If you phone somebody and you pick up the phone and phone them, you require them to answer the phone there and then. So when you phone somebody, the other person has to pick up the phone. And in message passing, that's called synchronous communication. There's a synchronization in time. Uh, if you think of the analogy of sending an email or posting a letter, that's asynchronous. You send the email, the email goes regardless of whether the receiver has read it or not, or even plans to, to read it. And then later on, hopefully in a correct program, the receiver will receive that email, read that message, open the letter. And so sending an email or posting a letter is in message passing speak asynchronous. So synchronous send is not completed until the message has started to be received, which is like making a phone call the other person has to pick up. Receives a, uh, an asynchronous send is like sending a letter. The send completes as soon as the message is gone. Receives uh, might surprise you, but receives, at least in MPI, are normally synchronous. The receiving process must wait until the message arrives. We'll come back to the, the ramification of that later on. So um, I. I talked about uh, making a phone call as being synchronous. Sending a fax, well, in the old days, it used to be a good analogy. In the old days, you put a fax in the fax machine, the fax, uh, the fax machine sent the fax, and then the important point was you got a beep. So you got a beep that told you the fax had been received. This probably isn't such a good analogy now because fax machines will scan and send later. So. I should maybe update this, although I do quite like the animation, which is why I've kept it. But the, maybe the, um, a more sort of an, another example for an analogy of, of synchronous send is making a phone call. So making a phone call is synchronous. However, sending a letter is a very good analogy for an asynchronous send. You only know when the letter has been posted, not when it has been received. So here, the post MPI, the message passing system, plays the role of the, of the postmaster here. Who picks up the message and, and hopefully delivers it, but you don't really know if and when it actually got there. And we'll come back to um, what the various uses of, of that later on. So we've talked about point-to-point -point communications here. 
which is one sender and one receiver. Um, so that's the simplest form of message passing. And I said, it's a good analogy. Good analogies are making phone calls and sending emails. Um, it's the simplest form of message passing and it relies on matching send and receive. And as a, there's analogies for sending question emails or, or making phone calls. However, there are situations where um, point to one communication isn't, isn't the most efficient thing to do. And for example, um, delivering this lecture is an example. I could deliver this lecture through point to point communications. Every time I wanted to, um, to tell you something, I could selectively, um, um, actually I'm not in the, um, I normally talk to the example of whispering in somebody's ear, but what I could do is I could use chat, and if I wanted to tell you something, I could, one by one, I could send the chat message directly to each person in turn. Chat with person one, chat with person two, chat with person three, chat with person four. That would clearly work. Each of those transactions is a point-to-point -point communication, but it'd be very inefficient. And there are a lot of cases where, although point-to-point -point communication can achieve what you want, it's not efficient. So what you want to do is maybe maybe to do something like a one-to-all, which is what I'm doing now, which is MPI message passing calls or broadcast. And so modern message passing systems have two forms of communication which they differentiate. One is point-to-point -point communication, which is sending and receiving messages. They also have higher level communications um, uh, protocols, which are called collective communication. And I'll cover conceptually a few uses of those. So, uh, a simple, a simple message communication between two processes. Um, there's instances where communication between groups of processes require, so we're communicating with each other now, I'm broadcasting data to all of you. They could be built from simple messages, but, but often the reason that they're, they're, they're implemented separately, that they're conceptually thought of as a different way of communicating, is they can be implemented in more efficient ways. A barrier to global synchronization. Um, you may not think of that as communication, but, but clearly it requires people to talk to each other. This is a line in the sand. So you can think of saying, before we started this lecture, we all collectively issued a barrier. We agreed that we would all line up until half past one when I would start lecturing and we would move on. So a barrier is a way of synchronizing processes in time. Remember I said MPI works by running, message passing works by running multiple processes. These processes can run at different speeds because they're running on different Conceptually, they could be run on different computers. If you want to line them all up, you want them all to, to, to start the starting line at the same time, they can issue a barrier. Now, it turns out it's something of a deep point that actually barriers are almost never required in, in message passing programs for correctness. Um, and we'll come back to that later on. Um, a more useful one is a broadcast. A broadcast is a one to all communication. So I, I, I'm, I'm broadcasting data to all of you now. And that's often used at the start of a simulation of the program. So you would read in some data, possibly on, on some controller process, um, the number of iterations that I have some parameter down to, or, or the temperature, or the, number, or the size of your simulation. And you want to let everybody know about that. So what you do is you read the data in and you broadcast it. It's a one to all communication. And so what would happen in message passing is, you start off with data on um, one process. So this process here has, has data eight. If I want all the other processes to get hold of that data, I can issue a broadcast and I will copy the value to all the other processes. So they all get eight. Um, it's very important to realize here though that when I talk about collective communication in message passing terminology, all these processes, all one, two, three, four, five, six of them are all executing a broadcast. They all are calling the broadcast function. Within that, they have different roles. We've nominated one as being a sender and the other N minus one being receivers. But it's important to, to note that everyone is executing the broadcast. So one of the key components of successful collective communication is everybody must call the collective communication. And that's a classic mistake people make. You might think here, well, only this guy needs to call the communicate the, the broadcast because he said he or she is sending the data right, but these other um, uh, these these um, these workers also need to call the broadcast to allow them to receive the data. Scatter is a bit like a broadcast except you don't send the data to everybody. So you have made a, read an array which can um, try and um, compose one, not one, two, three, four, five. If I broadcast this array everybody would get a copy of the whole array. But maybe I don't, I want, this might be my analogy with weather forecast, this might be a map of the UK, I want different people to get different segments of the map. So a broadcast replicates data everywhere, a scatter divides data up. 
And so I could use a scatter to divide this data. If I did a scatter, what would happen is that it would be, it would be split up so that it turns out this, this um, person is rank two, but the data is split up so it gets not one, two, three, four, five. That's called a scatter. Again, you often do that at the start of a program. You broadcast the, the main parameters, you read in the big data set, and you scatter the data set in chunks out to the, in this case, that thought of them as being worker processes. The inverse of a gather is a scatter. That's right. The inverse of scatter is a gather. And you would, might do this at the end of a program where you have distributed data, everyone has their own data, and you want to write it out the disk. So the easiest way to do that is to collect it all together on, on, on a um, controller process and then write it out. So a gather, again, takes data which is distributed and gathers it together onto a nominated root. So after the gather, all the data would go back and we would end up with not one, two, three, four, five, again, a simple example. The broadcast, scatter, and gather are, are, are things which are typically used at startup and shutdown of a program. However, the major use of collectives are reduction operations. What you have, have all the time in a message passing program is each process, and there could be hundreds or thousands of them, has its own data, and you want to combine it together. So an example here is a vote. So a reduction operation takes distributed data, each process, each, each person has their own data, but it comes up with a single answer. So in this, in this um, example, everyone has their own vote, yes or no, do you want to go on strike, but by majority, we really come up with a single answer, okay? So a reduction operation takes distributed data and comes up with a single answer. And in fact, in scientific and technical programming, by far the most commonly used one is, is a reduction operation doing a global sum. You have distributed data, not one, two, three, four, five, and I want to add them together. Again, using the weather forecasting example, these processes might know the rainfall over each of their sections of the map. But that's a sort of a meaningless number because each process has a sort of arbitrary section of the map to work on. What might be meaningful is what's the total rainfall over the whole of, of, of the UK. To do that, you have to bring the data together to add, to add it all together. Or for example, I might want to know what's the average age of everybody attending this, attending this virtual tutorial. You all have your own age, but there's only one average. So what we would do, we would perform a reduction operation. We take all the distributed data and add it together to come up with the sum of all our ages, and then we would divide by the number of people to come, to come up with the average age. So addition is by far the most common reduction operation. So we take the numbers, not one, two, three, four, five. We add them together, we get 15. However, any, um, any um, associative operation is a valid reduction operation. So you could do a, a global product. Um, you might want to multiply data together. Um, you might do a, a, a max or a min. You might want to know what's the age of the oldest person on this seminar. Uh, it's probably me. What's the age of the youngest person on this seminar? You would do a max or a min. So the, the important point is you start off with distributed data where every process has their own number and you come up with a single answer by combining them together, reducing them to produce a single answer. And that's a very, very common thing that you do in, in message passing programs. So that's sort of conceptually what goes, goes on. Just to basically recap the process, and what we're going to do um, in, in, for about half two is we're going to start actually sort of comp compiler program, which I've got all the, um, all the intricacies sorted out. But the way that message passing works is, first of all, you write a single piece of source code. This is FPMD, single program multiple data. You write a single piece of source code, a single program. But every time you want to do message passing, send messages, or do a collective operation, you write calls to a message, and you write that in a standard language, in this course, C, C++, or Fortran. And then you have calls to message passing functions such as send and receive, and we'll see in M kind of what they're called. But you write calls to functions or subroutines which, which do what you want to do. Then you compile this, and it's not immediately obvious, but what you do is you compile with a standard compiler. Because message passing is implemented at the library, a pre-compiled set of, of, of standard functions, you can just compile the program. Okay, so you, your programs are compiled by your compilers, be it the GNU compilers or the Intel compilers, or whatever your favorite compilers are. But that compiled program is linked to this message passing library. As I said, although we're going to be programming using MPI, which is the standard, 
there are lots of implementations of MPI. There's open source implementations. Open MPI is quite a common one. Uh, there are vendor supplied ones. So if you're using Arctur, you want to use Cray MPI. If you're using uh, an Intel machine, you might use Intel MPI. But by compiling our program and linking it to our message passing library, we have an executable. You then run multiple copies of the same executable on your parallel machine. So if you have 64 CPU cores, you would run 64 copies of this program. Each copy becomes a separate process. And I think that the best analogy I have, it's slightly confusing these days with multi-core uh, multi machines, but I like to think of my analogy of a parallel machine as lots of laptops. And I run process one on this laptop, process two on another laptop, process three on another laptop, and they're connected by some network. Each copy comes a separate process. Each copy has its own private data distinct from the others because you know one process is running on this laptop, the other process is running on this laptop. Each copy could be a completely different line in the program. Now that's going to get quite um, painful if you want to launch a thousand copies of your program. Do I have to log on to a thousand laptops and run the program? Well, I could do that. I could log on to laptop one, run the program, copy the program to laptop two, log on, run the program. But that's not how it works. What MPI provides you for is a launcher program. And it typically, we'll see this is typically called something like MPI run. And what you say is, OK, here's my executable. Please run n copies of my executable. So you don't have to do it manually. There's some infrastructure to say, please run n copies of, 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 this, of this program. And then they will start talking to each other. Um, issues. Send to receive must match. There's a danger of deadlock. And so the, the biggest, well, I said before that, that, that sends were synchronous. So when you do a send, that, uh, sorry, sends could be synchronous or asynchronous. We can send messages by making a phone call or sending, sending an email. But receives are, in MPI are always synchronous. So if I issue a receive and there's no send, I wait there and nothing happens. And what happens is in MPI, it might be surprising, but there's no timeout. So if I, if, if I issue a receive and there's no send, I sit there forever waiting for a message to come in. In a correct program, at some, some later point, the message will come in. In an incorrect program, you may have forgot to send a message. And that's called deadlock. Your program just stops because there's a process asking for data which never arrives. And again, it may surprise you, but there are no timeouts in MPI. It will sit there forever. And so the classic problem we have with an MPI program, with any message passing program, is not that it runs and produces incorrect results. The typical symptom of an incorrect program is it just stops running very early on because you've not matched up the sense and received. It's possible to write very complicated programs, um, but actually, so if you've got a computer science um, um, hat on, it's actually um, it's an it's an NP hard problem. If you have an arbitrary piece of code, it's impossible in practice to analyze that program in its entirety to, to decide whether it has deadlock or not. It's too hard a problem to do. So you might say, how is it possible to write a correct message passing program when an arbitrary message passing program cannot be analyzed rigorously? Well, in fact, in scientific and technical programming, most scientific codes have relatively simple structures, which lead to relatively simple communications patterns. A standard one is you might have your processes in a grid, and you communicate with your four neighbors, up, down, left, right. It's fairly easy to program that up and get it correct. So in fact, um, although um, it is easy to make mistakes, it's not as hard as you might think. And um, for standard scientific and technical computing, we have fairly standard communications patterns. And we'll, we'll illustrate a couple of them in the examples for this course. However, you should use collective communications where possible. Often you see people writing very, very complicated programs and all they want to do is add a number together. They've done it by hand. They've got some complicated method. They're only studying the data for everybody else. There's a collective routine. There's a reduction routine to do that for you. So actually, you know, often, again, these reduction routines, these higher level collective operations make writing message passing programs uh, quite simple um, to do. So summary, in MPI and message passing, messages are the only form of communication. All communication is therefore explicit. So if you, you know, programs run on their own, they just sit on your laptop or the node of a computer just running away, and the only time they can possibly do communication is they explicitly issue a send or a receive. Most systems use SPMD. MPI does all processes run exactly the same code. 
a, that they're running a different copy of the same program. Each has a unique ID. The process can take different branches of the same code. So you can neither ask what the value of A nor what is what line is my program at. You have to say what is the value of A on process 95, what line is process 63 at. The basic communication form is point to point, but collective communications it also exists for more uh, general uh, patterns of communication. Summary, message passing and programming model um, is implemented in MPI. I said MPI is the only game in town. However, I like to encourage people to think about message passing the model. How am I going to implement this using send and receive in the SPMD model? And then say, okay, what, what are the MPI routines? Which particular functions or subroutines should I use? It's essential to understand these basic concepts. Private, the things which people tend to get wrong are as they forget, private, they, 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 they misunderstand private variables. They think they've got a variable A, they think that means that the value of A is the same in every process. It's not, unless you um, arrange for that by hand, for example, via broadcasting. There's explicit communications, unless you have sends and received, then all the processes are just running on their own. And it's SPMD, you write a single program, and you run multiple copies of that program at runtime, and they all have their own data. And my experience is that, that although everyone has issues with syntax and getting the programs to compile and such like, the major issue people have often is understanding this message passing model. Um, I, um, I do the face-to-face the, the, the -face course I try and make quite interactive. That's going to be harder to do in this format. But, you know, I have a, this is a very, very uh, innocuous line in a normal program. You've got a variable x, which you know has to be positive. So you just say, if x is less than zero, print error, then exit, okay? That's a perfectly safe thing to do. That's a very dangerous thing to do in a message passing uh, model, SPMD, we have multiple processes. I don't know if anyone can think of an idea, just um, chat, put in the chat window or say, why, why is that potentially a dangerous thing to do in a message passing program, when you have multiple copies of these, potentially multiple copies of this, um, of this line of code being, being executed at the same time across multiple processes. Options window. Okay, so what if some then quit and others don't jump? That's exactly the right point. So there are two things. X, because X, there's a different X on different processes, X can have a different, now you may have arranged for X to be the same, but in general, X will have different values on different processes. So some of the processes can quit and some might. So let's just take the extreme view. Only one, only one process has x less than zero. So one process quits, but all the other ones have x greater than zero, so they carry on going. You've got one process that stopped, and the other processes which are continuing running. That's not a problem immediately, but later on, you might want to receive a data from this process, so you issue a receive. But this process is dead, he's finished. So you will never receive that message. So a simple line like this can actually lead to deadlock. It doesn't fail here, but later on in the program, because some of your processes have stopped and other ones haven't, then, um, then you get a problem. So even a fairly innocuous line like this, to make this work correctly, you will have to do something like um, everyone set a flag, true or false, if x is less than zero, and have a collective operation where you all get together and say, did anyone have an error? Oh, yes, we did. Then we have to stop. Because the important point is there is no way for you to know that process has stopped unless they tell you. And the only way that you can tell somebody anything in their message passing is through sending a message. So you might say, well, what, what this pro if X is less than zero, I should just send a message to everyone saying, by the way, I'm about to stop. And the problem is I have to receive that message and receive it explicit. So I have to know I'm going to it get, you get into these kind of catch-22s very quickly. So I don't want to scare you off to put for, for the kind of regular um, calculations we do in scientific technical programming, it's not that bad normally, but you do need to be aware that simple things like this can catch you out. So that's the end of that lecture. So what I wanted to do now was slightly jump ahead um, and compile and run an MPI program. I normally do this later, I just wanted to, um, oops, I wanted to get this early, just to check that people had time to check their setup and um, so what I'm going to do, oh, that, that's come up, remember the share, did it, fine. Oh, so someone's asked here, sorry, in the design program, do you consider a control process which does collect right here but not main calculations? That's a very, very good question. So um, 
the way we'll see that in MPI, MPI does not distinguish between processes. All processes are the same in MPI. So um, conventionally, we pick a, a controller process, which might be rank zero. However, normally what is done is um, that um, controller process will take part in calculations and then just do the I.O. later on. I mean, you, you can nominate a single process um, just to do um, the, the, the writing data. But what that means is they read in data, send it out to the other process, then they do nothing for three or four hours, and then they'd have to receive the data back. So in fact, in most MPI programs, this might become more obvious when we write them, there, you may nominate a controller process, but it will also be one of the, one of the workers. The other reason is actually quite pragmatic. On something like Archer, um, we have 24 MPI processes per node. You might run on eight um, processes, uh, eight nodes. You have 192 CPU cores. 192 is quite a nice number. It's six times 32. It's 12 times. Um, it's 12 times 18. But if I take one of those out, I have 191 processes. 191. I couldn't guarantee you. It sounds like a prime number to me. You're going to tell me it's not. But it's a pretty nasty number. So you know. Again, for pragmatic reasons, we tend to use all the MPI processes, otherwise we have to cope with uh, nasty numbers. But that's a good question. Uh, in most MPI programs, the controller is also, it acts as a controller in various parts of the program, but will muck in and, and, and for most of the program will be just like the other processes. That was a very good question. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the data analytic cluster as an example of, um, of how we're going to compile and run a very simple program. And hopefully we can all do this before the break and then just check it works. So I'm going to give some comments on how this works on your system will be similar but not identical. But first of all, um, for the data analytic cluster, if you, have an app, if you have an account, you want SSH in using your user, which will be something which will you'll, you'll, you'll pick your username. At login.rdf.ac.uk. That's the URL. For, that's the IP address for this um, computer. So, um, if you're running on your laptop, you won't have to do that. If you're using a cluster, you'll have to log on some other cluster. Um, the Archer system, such as RDF, could be accessed by SSH from anywhere. When I say it's trivial for Linux, what I mean by that is that Linux has SSH installed uh, by default. Mac users, if you want to display graphics, you may have to install um, something called X Quartz. On Windows, um, if you want to, you have to install Putty to have access to SSH. If you want to install to display graphics, you may have to install something called X Main. For the very simple example we're going to do on this course, you won't need to, to export graphics from the data analysis cluster back to your laptop. So it might make editing easier, but um, but that's um, that's not going to be an issue. Um, an issue. So you can log in with that. I'll 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 switch another screen to show you how this how this works in, in, in practice. On the data analytics cluster, we have to do a couple of slightly weird things for, for, for technical reasons. We have to um, we have to switch the MPI. So we're going to use something called Open MPI on the data analytics cluster. We have to switch from Open MPI to Open MPI x sixty x eighty six slash sixty four. That's just a slight quirk. And also, um, it's easier if you unload the GNU compilers. The, um, the most recent GNU compilers are a bit too recent to cope with this for this version of MPI. We get so I would I would um, um, say that we that we um, that we should um, unload um, the GCC compilers. Uh, the, sorry, GCC. So that's unfortunately that's a bit of a bit of a quirk on, on the DAC, but you should do that. If you're just on your laptop, you probably won't know. To, you won't need to do this. Um, Fortran programmers should compile programs with the MPI F90 compiler. C programmers should use MPI CC. C plus programmers should use MPI CXX. Now, I'm telling you to use special compilers, but I I kind of said a lot beforehand that, that the message passing, in particular MPI, isn't implemented by our compiler. You don't need special compilers done via a library. These aren't really compilers, they're just wrappers, which, which find all the header files and stuff like that. So in the setup on the DAC, and probably on your laptop, so the compilation is done by the standard here, the GNU compilers, GCC or G4Sham, G++. These are just wrappers which, which find all the libraries you like. So, um, um, 
So, and, you, and to run, th this course is designed to teach you to uh, program an API. Ultimately, you'll be worried about performance, but when you're learning, you're not so concerned about performance. And so it's much easier to run interactively. If, you want to, if you're concerned about performance, you need to have dedicated access to resources, which you might have on your laptop. If you're something on, on a big HPC system like Archer, what you would do is you'd have to submit a job to the batch system and request um, exclusive access to resources and run on those, and that's all too much of a hassle. So one of the reasons we're using the data analytic cluster, which is a, an adjunct to Archer, is on Archer, you cannot run MPI program interactively. When you log on to Archer, you're on a login node, you can't run MPI program interactively, which makes teaching MPI and Archer quite hard work. On the data analytics cluster, which looks much more like a standard Linux cluster, you can compile and run on just, just on the login nodes, and that makes things much easier. So um, what I will do is I will now share, so you should be able to, I will share a different screen. So I will now share my terminal window. I'm on a Windows, I'm on a Windows system. So you should now see my terminal window, which is actually a party window. So I'm, I'm, I've actually logged on to the, 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 the DAC, um, which is called um, RDF, uh, Research Data um, Facility, .ac.uk. I'm gonna log in as my Y14 account, Y14 DSH, and there's a password. If you get your password wrong, please don't keep retrying and retrying, because after a certain number of attempts, I think it's, half a dozen or ten, you will get locked out. It's unlikely there is a danger if you're in a shared classroom that your account being locked out will lock out everybody in the classroom because as far as we are concerned from this side, you're all coming from the same internet address. It, it, so if, if, if you have problems logging in, don't try more than two or three, you know, take a step back, check that you know your password, maybe ask for a new password by the website. Um, when you sign up for an Archer account, you have the same, sorry, you, your, your same credentials work on, on, on the DAG, the Atramity Cluster. It is physically a different computer. You see a um, slightly different file structure there, but your, your, your account name and password are the same. So um, you could log into Arch just now, but as I said, it's, it's a hassle to run, to, for, for learning, it's a hassle to, um, to, to compile and run programs on Arch. So we've decided to target you to this data analytic cluster, which has the same login name and password. If you'll see on the website, the timetable, I've given very simple C, C++ and Fortran examples. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm, you can't see as I'm off screen, but I'm just cutting and pasting the C example. Now the editors, um, uh, we don't have that many editors on the data traffic cluster. The two we have are Vim, which I'm not particularly familiar with, but also have Emacs, which is a bit of a uh, um, universal, um, um, but uh, I'm going to call it hello.c. NW stands for no window. I'm going to do internal. That's nicely what Emacs. So I'm, I'm not exporting graphics here. I'm just, um, so I've got an editor, which is Emacs. I can now paste, hopefully that. Well, so this is the code. If you go to the, the website, you'll see I've got LinkedIn, um, some simple codes, which do almost nothing. And an Emacs, um, hopefully, is um, a control X, Control S saves, Control X, Control T exits. So I mean, you can use Vim if you want, um, and whatever. If you're, if you're working on your laptop or, or some other machine, you can use whatever favorite editor you want. But uh, you want to just get a copy of the, the, the file which I have on the, um, on the website into your, um, into, into your um, uh, computer. You can, if you want to, what I did to get that is I went to the website, I clicked on the C program, and I just cut and paste it, okay? What you can also do is you can, you can actually copy the URL. So I could, if I want to get the Fortran one, I can actually uh, copy link address. So I've copied that link. The problem is, if you're using your laptop, you can just cut, you can click on these and download them to your laptop. But if you're using an external system, like I'm using data analytics cluster, Clicking on this file doesn't help, but downloaded to my laptop, and then I have to get the laptop with the data and this plus stuff. But what I've done is I've copied the URL there, and now if I go back, I can use wget. Wget is your friend here at the web, get from this, the web. I paste that URL there, and I, it pulls it across. So if I emacs that now, 
you'll see that I point across the Fortran program there. So hopefully, um, well, whatever system you're using, you'll be able to um, create a file on whatever file system you're on containing the code from hello.c or hello.f90. So what I do now, as I said, I use the, the um, MPI CC is the compiler, and it's just like any other compiler. I'm saying I want to compile hello.c and I want to call the output hello. I could call it hello.x or whatever I want. So that should just compile that. That's done it. And if I do an ls, you will see um, that. If I do an ls, you will see that among lots of other rubbish here, uh, you will see that I've now created a um, hello executable. And the way I run that, and this is true on most systems, except our attributes, but we say MPI run. So the MPI run minus n4 dot slash hello. Um, so I have, I have not done my talk. But now, you'll see I got lots of errors there. The reason was I hadn't done my, what I told you to do, which is to module switch open MPI with open MPI. Um, I've done some. I've done some um, some weird stuff here. So let's unload GCC. So I've forgotten to do the thing which I told you to do. So now, if I, I'll recompile just to, to, to the um, MPICC, and then I do an MPI run. And I get so all the output I got before it was just lots of warnings. If you log onto the DAC and use the default settings, you can compile and run MPI programs using MPI CC and MPI run, but you get lots of warning messages. I think the warning messages are actually because MPI on the DAC is configured for the compute nodes which have real InfiniBand interconnect, which we don't have. You're just on a, a standard login node here. And it's complaining about something like that. So this, the, the, those two modules you have to run, which I, I have in the slides there, um, get rid of all that stuff. So what I've done here is I've run four copies of the Hello program. All they did was Hello World. And if you look at the actual code, you'll see that although I initialized, I haven't done, this initializes MPI and this finalizes it. All I did was print Hello World. So I ran four copies of this program, but they all did the same thing. So I'm actually not able to tell which, which of these ran where. I mean, they were four processes. I don't know which one was process naught, process one, process two, process three. But I'm only doing this exercise, which I've pulled a bit forward from, just to check that people can compile and, and, and run either on the DAC or on whatever system that they are, that they are um, that they're using. So if I just go back to um, the slide, on the DAC, you log in with SSH. You have to do these couple of module switches, module switch, open MPI, open MPX, 8664, and you have to unload GCC. You can then compile programs with MPI F90, MPI CC, or your C++ program with MPI CXX. And then you should be able to MPI run whatever you've called your program. I called it hello. So um, that should all work. Um, um, now, if you're on your laptop, that might just work out the box. Um, is anyone having any? Is anyone on having issues on, who's using the data analytics cluster having issues um, doing that? Okay, great. Okay, well, fine, brilliant. The, my only concern, real concern, was uh, editors. Um, the, the the editors we. Okay, I can't make an example. So, Colin. Where they are is you go to the training page on Archer, just the main training page, Archer AC UK slash training. You click on this course message passing programs with that program with MPI. And there I've linked them in uh, week one. These are the slides for the first, and then there I have here a simple test for the CC from Fortran. So that's that's um, those that's where you should get them from. And you can either cut and paste them by clicking on them, um, oops. click on them and cut and paste them if you want, 
or you can um, grab the URL and then you get them. The other thing in this course is I really don't hand out any code because um, it's actually, I mean, it, it is worth um, programming from scratch and writing programs from scratch and putting in the MPI. However, you will see that on the website, I do have um, a tar, here's a tar file containing simple solutions. So if I just wanted, Ah, uh, okay. Thanks. That's useful. Okay, so um, so Matt doesn't have the WGA, but it worked with curl. Curl minus O minus L. Okay, thanks. That's a useful comment. Uh, so if you're on your own Mac, you should be able to just um, click on them and download them. But if you do want to WGA them, it looks like you have to use curl. Um, what I'll do is I'll skip the last few slides. We're pretty much ahead of time. I, I want I left a lot of gap here to um, um, to um, allow for any issues. Documentation, the MPI standard is available online. I say the current version is 3.1, I actually think there's a version 3.2, but it's effectively the same. Um, it is available, it is not, um, it's not reading material, it is a reference document. Um, so um, it's over 700 pages now, most of which you won't use. It's available in printed form, um, people at um, uh, Stuttgart, HLRS Stuttgart will print a copy on demand if you want to. They don't do it at profit, it's purely at cost. But it is available online um, and it is pretty meaty. Um, but man pages are available. Unfortunately, actually, the man, so, so the MPI standard isn't really readable. It's a full reference man, so it tends to be too detailed to learn from. The problem with the, um, the man pages, which do exist, are uh, they're pretty terse. They don't give much more than the um, the, the uh, prototype functions. So um, hopefully all the documentation you want will be provided in this course. But I'll, I'll, uh, um, MPI books, if you want to buy a book, and I'm not involved, I'm not related to this book at all, so it's not my own plug, but the guy, these guys, William Gropp, um, Ewing Lusk, and Anthony Skellum, I hope I don't think I pronounced his name right, were involved in the definition of MPI way back in, um, in the early 90s. This book used to be a bit of a reference book, but actually they've, the most recent edition is very readable. They start off with, a, with an example and say, how would you do this in message passing? How would you then design your library? And it's got a lot of, of example codes. This is really, uh, this is, this is really the go-to book if you want a textbook to learn MPI from. If you want to, the course could only go into a certain amount of depth. I, th this is a very good textbook. Um, so I would recommend getting a copy of this if, if that's what you want to do. Although the, 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 the manual is available for free, it's not really that much, that much use. And okay, we've done the Hello World. So what I will do is I will, to give us more time, I'll carry on with the timetable, but I'll just go ahead to the next lecture and I'll, I'll lecture for the next 10 minutes and take a break at an appropriate point. The reason is I've had to, to try and get the practical stuff up front just to, to get the practicality sorted out. I slightly reorders from what I normally do, um, but that means I will now do this lecture. Okay, so I'm basically going to, uh, we jumped ahead a bit there showing a real MPI program for this minute, but I wanted to check that, give you something uh, just to compile around. So I'll, I'll just do, for the next 10 minutes, I'll, I'll start talking about MPI. So the idea is I've talked about message passing as a concept, as a way of thinking about parallel programming. And what we're going to talk a bit more about what the details of MPI are. What is MPI? Well, the MPI forum um, produced the MPI. MPI is a standard. It, 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 it's a it's a definition of a library, um, and it was the first message passing interface standard. And as you'll see there, it was produced well over twenty years ago in the early nineties, and actually it basically um, came about in sort of through Darwinian evolution, exactly the right way for a standard. Parallel, pro, parallel computers started to become prevalent in the sort of mid to late 80s. But in the early days, every time you've got a parallel computer, you've got a different message passing library. It might be a different language, it might be a different library, different interfaces. So the good thing was everybody was designing their own, doing good things and bad things, finding out how things worked, what worked, what didn't. But the bad thing was there were lots and lots of different standards, all incompatible. And if it's the third or fourth time you've had to rewrite your program for a different, different message passing library, you start to really get a bit cheesed off. And so what happened is that lots of people got together in the early 90s 
and they came up with what was the best of breed. They took hopefully what was the best examples from all the, the, the ideas they'd had and put them together into MPI. EPCC was involved in that standardization process. Um, it involved both um, users and vendors. That's very, very important. As a user, you want the message party library to do everything. You want it to be magic. As a vendor, you have to write the library. You want it to do nothing. So, so there's a, there was a nice um, um, uh, meeting of minds there. And it was, it was international. The US and Europe were involved. Um, after two years of proposal meetings and review, they produced the message passing interface document <coughs> in 1993. And although the documents got a lot bigger over the time, fundamentally, MPI hasn't changed in the past 25 years. You know, if you take a, a, a simple, M, fairly simple MPI program from today, went back in time 25 years, it would be recognizable. They, they kind of got the basics right first time. A lot of enhancements and tweaks around the edges and things to accommodate C++ and stuff like that, but the core stayed very much the same. MPI has a library of functions or subroutine calls. MPI is not a language, but no such thing as an MPI compiler. And that means that basically when you run your C or Fortran compiler, it knows nothing about the MPI actually done. It might call a send routine. Your compiler knows nothing about that routine. It could be printing an icon on the screen. It could be making your key keyboard go beep. Hopefully, it will be able to complain if you get the syntax wrong. We'll come back to that. Hopefully, it will say, look, this function expected six arguments. You're only giving me five, but it doesn't know anything about it. So the compiler is of zero help to you in debugging the, the functionality of an MPI program. It won't say, oh, you've got a send here that doesn't seem to be a receive. The compiler knows nothing about MPI. The goals and scope of MPI are to provide source code portability and to allow efficient implementation. So by source code portability, what I mean is if I write a program, a correct MPI program that compiles and runs on my laptop, it should compile and run correctly on Archer. Despite the fact it's using a different MPI library, if I've called it correctly, obeying the rules of the, of the library, the function prototype, it will run. And to allow efficient implementation, MPI, there's lots of functions you might want as a user, but MPI doesn't provide them if they're not efficient. And that would, that's a deliberate choice. You wouldn't want to look up the MPI stand and say, oh, there's, a, there's this function which does this magic thing. It, it does something really nice that you want to do. You call it, and it's really slow. MPI is designed to be efficient, and so they only provide functions which can be implemented relatively efficiently. It has a great deal of functionality, probably too much functionality. And something I'll mention here is that, in principle, it offers support for heterogeneous parallel architectures. Back in the day, in the early 90s, one model for parallel programming was, I mean, when I go home tonight and leave this office, which is in a large science block in the south of Edinburgh, there are thousands and thousands of computers in this, in the JCMB, the James Class Macworld building where I am. And every now and again, people say, well, wait a second, why can't I run a parallel program across all the computers in this, um, in this, in this building? They're all connected by the internet. Why can't I run a parallel program? The biggest challenge you have there is that they're different architectures. Some will be Mac machines, some will be Windows machines, some will be Linux, some will be Intel chips, some may be ARM chips. In principle, MPI supports that model. In principle, MPI allows you to run a single parallel program with multiple heterogeneous parallel, where the, the nodes, the computers, are different architectures, different operating systems, running different compilers. So you can imagine there's a lot of problems there. One, one architecture might use four bit in, four byte integers, one might use eight byte integers, one might store its, its real numbers little endy in front, and the other one might draw them big endy and back to front. And so MPI in principle has to be able to translate between all these different representations. And MPI can in principle do that. However, nobody does that. Machines like Archer have 100,000 cores, all identical processors. The biggest difference is they might have slightly different clock rates, but they're all Intel x86 processors running Linux. I mean, 25 years ago, there were lots of operating systems, lots of compilers, lots of hardware manufacturers. Now in HPC, there's Linux and Intel, basically. I mean, hopefully ARM will come back into the picture. But So sometimes MPI routines look more complex than they need to be. That's often because, well, imagine that we were running on um, uh, simultaneously across a Windows machine and a Mac. What, what issues would that have? So I mentioned that now, but it's, it's, not a, it's not a model which is used in practice. Um, so I will probably basically just 
Now I'll cover this slide. Because MPI is a library, you have to include a header file. And in C or C++, you have to include MPI.h. Um, I will maybe mention this slightly on, but MPI is not an OO interface. You can call it from C++, but if you call it from C++, you have to call it as if it were a C library. So basically, you have to call it that they are C libraries. So you can't use any of your uh, nice C++ functionality. It's just a C library, which you can call from C++. 477, I hope nobody's using anymore, including MPI. F.H. 490, you should do use MPI. Now, there are some slight technicalities that um, which come about with this, because when Fortran, when MPI was first defined, um, Fortran 90 hadn't been invented, it was back in the very early 90s. And there are incompatibilities between MPI and Fortran that mean that technically, MPI routines are not legal Fortran routines. And I'll come back around the case of that later on. More recently, the interface between Fortran and C was quite precisely defined uh, in Fortran 2008. So if you want to do the most modern Fortran uh, version of MPI, Fortran 2008, you should use MPI F08, the Fortran 2008 library. Now, in this course, I teach the Fortran 90 version of MPI. Um, I will, through means of an example, discuss what the Fortran 2008 bindings look like. They're quite simple, but I should, if you're a Fortran programmer, I will be assuming you'll be using Fortran 90 and doing use MPI. I'll, it, I should probably update the course now because this is becoming more widespread. Um, Fortran always lies behind, so for, I mean, this says Fortran 2008, but it wasn't really Fortran. And we very recently become um, standardized. But I'll come back to that next example. And basically, I think probably that's that. So what I'll do is I've just covered the header files. What we'll come back to when I start lecturing after half past three is I'll actually start talking about what do MPI functions actually look like. Where we got to before was um, starting with our first piece of real code, the head of files, CC++, you hash into the MPI.8, 477, which you shouldn't really use, but uh, you might see in historical code. We'll be focusing on this interface, Fortran 90, use MPI. I've just checked and um, there are slight issues with using this most modern interface on, on the DAC. So I will explain how it works, but um, I will um, best done with an example. So for the moment, we're using the Fortran 90 interface where you do use MPI and not this interface, which, which has some issues uh, due to the setup. So MPI is a bunch of library calls, so you have function calls, and they all have the same format. In C, Every MPI call begins MPI underscore a capital letter, then lowercase letters and some parameters, and it returns an error code. Now, um, C being C, you can just ignore that error code if you want. Now, um, you should normally, you really should never ignore error codes, but um, there is a slight, the way MPI works um, is that by default, whenever it detects an error, it crashes. So that, that, that is the default behavior. You can change that, but by, by default, MPI will just crash. So in fact, if you, although you should check the error code, you religiously check the error code. If there is an error in this MPI routine, by default, it will crash, and you'll never get the error. So a lot of people are lazy, myself included, and they program like this. They ignore the error code. Um, you shouldn't really do that, but it is, fairly common, it is a fairly common thing to do. In Fortran, for reasons that I've never quite understood, uh, Fortran programs don't like functions, although they exist in Fortran, um, they much prefer subroutines. So in Fortran, the error uh, variable, the, the error parameter is an extra variable. Now, so again, the difference is the, for, the Fortran function, MPI underscore, whatever, MPI, Fortran is case insensitive, so the capitalization doesn't matter. And there's an extra parameter, which is the error code. You have to supply it, even if you never look at it. In one of the extensions is, in Fortran 2008, the error code is optional, but we'll be using the, the, the slightly older Fortran 90 interface, so you have to, you have to provide it. So just like, um, MPI controls a lot of internal data structures. Um, and for example, we'll see that MPI has a concept of groups of processors. So MPI says there are groups of processors. MPI maintains all that information and it returns you something to refer to that. So if you want to define a group of processors, MPI manages all the details 
and the variable you return to it is called MPI calls them handles. So these are just these are just um, variables which you have to declare. So, but the MPI calls them handles. So they refer to much more complicated data structures. The, the the analogy I use is if in C, if you open a file, you just declare a file point, a file style FP. It's a single variable. Clearly, the system is maintaining a huge amount of state about what that means. But you just have this file pointer. Similarly, in Fortran, if you want to open a file, you just open the unit number, unit twelve. The system is maintaining a whole lot of information about what that means, but you just have this one reference to it, uh, unit number 12. So in MPI, if it declares a more complicated object like a group of processors, it gives you a variable which is called a handle, which you have to remember. In C, these are all type def, so in C, they're different types. In Fortran, um, at least the, the Fortran 90 interface, they're just integers. But this sounds a bit weird at the moment, but we'll come back to what that means later on. To initialize MPI, um, you call the MPI init routine. In Fortran, it's quite straightforward. MPI init I error, you call it. In C, it's slightly confusing because it takes it has a rather complicated prototype. It takes a pointer to arg C and a, a triple pointer to arg B. This is all slightly complicated, but the reason is that um, in principle, you, you can imagine a system where um, I, I, I launch an MPI program from a terminal. And remember that spawns lots of lots of um, lots of MPI processes. You can imagine a system where uh, only the MPI processes attached to the terminal knows the command line argument. And so, what this actually does is it allows the MPI init routine to broadcast the command line arguments to every process. So this slightly convoluted um, prototype is because of that. It'll become more obvious when I, sh um, I show you a, um, a real program. But the most important point is that all, this must be the first MPI procedure called. However, it does not create the MPI processes. The multiple MPI processes are created at launch time. When you do MPI run, that creates multiple MPI processes. When you call MPI init, all it does is it allows them to talk to each other. So MPI init does not create the parallel processes. It just allows them to talk to each other. Uh, so a standard MPI program in C will, will start off with int main. If you've got command line arguments, you'll have int arg C, car star arg B. And then when you call MPI in it, you have to pass a pointer to arg C and a pointer to arg B. So this is what you actually call MPI in it. Now, because you point your pointer to arg C, this is an int star. This has already got two stars on it, so this becomes a triple star. It's a little bit horrible, and you might say, well, I don't use command line parameters, I don't use command line arguments, so in fact, it's perfectly acceptable to pass null and null. So most C programs, MPI programs, begin like this, int main, MPI init null, that initializes MPI. It has to be the first MPI call you make, but it's not necessarily the first call you make. In four trials, it's a bit simpler, program my MPI program, integer I error, Call MPI in the IR. Unfortunately, you cannot omit the IR argument even though you never look at it. So that's how you initialize MPI. You need to um, now the most important concept in MPI is a communicator. All um, communications in MPI take place within a communicator, which is fun, which is a group of processes. Um, so it will turn out that we probably won't have time to cover it on this course. But what you can do in MPI is you, you, you might run on a machine which has 128 processes, processors. You run 128 processes. You can split them into groups. You can effectively split the machine up in software. You can tell MPI, I want you know, these even-numbered processes to be one group and these odd-numbered processes to be another group. And the, in MPI terminal, they become separate communicators. They're communications worlds. And uh, messages are ring fence to be within a communicator. Every send and receive call takes a communicator as an argument which specifies the group of processes which that communication is, is, is relevant for. Now, there's a predefined communicator called MPI com world. And so in all the exercises we'll do on this course, if you see a routine which needs a communicator, you should just pass the MPI com world. It's predefined, it always exists, and it includes all the processes which are in the MPI program. So in, in future, you might do more advanced things and pass a communicator, which wasn't MPI com world, which was a subset. But, but, but for, the, for the simple kind of um, introduction we're going to do here, if ever you see you need a communicator, just specify MPI com world. So 
The most important thing you have to do is you have to identify the processes in a communicator. You cannot write a useful parallel program unless each process knows who they are. Am I zero, one, two, three? And MPI calls that a rank. And what you do in MPI is you have an inquiry function which says, what is my rank in this communicator? So you give it a communicator and it gives you back a rank. So in C, you pass the communicator, which is of type MPI com, and this is one of these handles, and you get back the rank. Or in Fortran, you pass the communicator, which is of type integer, and you get back the rank, and you have to pass an error parameter. So what MPI com rank does, it says, what is my rank in this communicator? Your most important, and this is guaranteed to be unique, and the numbering is naught to n minus one. Now, the most, your most important rank is your rank in MPI com world, because that is guaranteed to be globally unique. So if, if I launch a program on 100 processes, then MPI com world will contain all those processes that will have 100 processes in it. You're asking, what is my rank within that communicator? What is my rank within MPI com world? You'll get back a unique ID, which allows you to identify yourself from all your colleagues. And if you run on 100 processes, it will guarantee to be between 0 and 99. There's no physical meaning to this. It doesn't necessarily mean you know, you, your processors might have physical numbers. This is a, a logical thing. Each process will have a, a different um, logical rank. How the processes are assigned to physical processors is another question we won't really cover here. This is a bit of a nightmare for Fortran programmers because the rank numbers from 0 to n minus 1, not from 1 to n. So that's going to catch you out as a Fortran programmer. You need to remember that the, the ranks go from 0 to n minus 1, not 1 to n. And so it's maybe easiest if we see it in a real program. So we've initialized MPI. What you do, you want your rank. You define a variable, which is an integer. Sorry, I jumped forward. And I, uh, so in C program, we do an integer rank. We call, we initialize MPI, we do MPI com rank, MPI com world rank. Then what is my rank in this communicator? And because we're specifying MPI com world, which is guaranteed to contain all the processes, this is guaranteed to be a globally unique number. Or in Fortran, integer IRA, integer rank, call MPI com rank, you give MPI com world, which is predefined in MPI.h for the on the module, I get back the rank, and I write hello from rank rank. So that's that's going to be the first exercise is actually to extend the, the simple hello world program. To actually print out who you are, and then you'll be able to tell you know which which rank is actually printing that line. The other thing you need to know though is you also need to know how many processes there are. It may not be obvious, but you don't write an MPI program tied to a number of processes. What you should really do is write an MPI program which can run on any number of processes. The number of processes is defined at launch time. You say please run a hundred copies of this program, then you whether when, when each process boots up, it doesn't know that there are 99 other people. So what you also need to do, as well as knowing who you are, you need to know how many of there are, how many of there are, how many there are of you. And MPI says, well, you can ask how many processes are contained within the communicator. So if I go back, this communicator, how many processes does it have? It has 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, it has seven uh, processes. And I can do that on any communicator. But if I ask for the size, so I can I can inquire not just what what is my rank in this communicator, but is what is how big is this communicator? How many processes does this communicator contain? MPI com size. Now, of course, if I pass MPI com world, I'm asking how many processes does MPI com world contain? That's asking how many processes were launched. So when you, you when you launch an MPI program, the MPI process doesn't immediately know how many how many workers, how many colleagues they have, but they can ask, how big is MPI com world? It's the same thing as asking how many processes were launched. So the other classic thing you do, I don't have it here, but instead of MPI com rank, and passing a rank, you call MPI com rank gives back a different number on each process. MPI com size will give back the same number. So you do MPI com size, MPI com world, and the point of the size, call MPI com size, MPI com world and then size that will give you back how many processes there are. So those are the two critical things you need to know before you can do anything useful. A, how big is the communicator? How many of us are there? And B, what is my um, my rank? And the rank is guaranteed to be in the range north to size minus one. You have to exit MPI um, 
MPI finalized, it must be the last MPI procedure call. But the model in MPI is that you, you call MPI in it, and then you run your program for an hour, 10 hours a day, and then you call finalize at the end. You don't duck in and out. In fact, you cannot reinitialize MPI. So after you call finalize, you can't call MPI in it again. So a typical MPI program, you'll initialize MPI at the start, you'll run for yeah, several hours or whatever, and then right at the end, you finalize MPI, then you finish the program. You don't initialize finalize. You don't break in and out of parallelism. The parallelism is, is ongoing for the entirety of the program. It must be the last MPI procedure call. It doesn't have to be the last thing you do, but typically it's the, about the last thing you do before you finish the program. You can abort MPI. Um, again, I, I put this slide in because people often ask this, but um, MPI finalize is a clean exit. So basically if, some, if one of the processes is called MPI finalize early, it will wait around until all the other processes arrive and then it will exit cleanly. You can think of it as having a barrier in there. Sometimes you should try and cope with errors clearly, but sometimes you find an error where you really just have to crash and burn. So the nuclear option in MPI is called MPI abort. This isn't a clean abort. This isn't like MPI finalize where everyone waits. It basically kills your process, kills all the other processes. They'll all dump core and do horrible things. It will abort all process, even if calls on one process. So it's a horrible thing to do, but sometimes, you know, something has desperately gone wrong. You might want to call MPI abort, but you should try and avoid it. You should really try and do clean exit. Another thing which is useful is what machine am I on? This can be can be quite useful. Um, if I go back to, well, I don't have the slide immediately at hand, but um, a modern a modern machine is quite a parallel machine is quite complicated. There will be a lot a number of separate physical machines like different laptops. But each laptop, each physical machine will have multiple quarters, might have four cores in it. And so if you've got two laptops here and I run an eight process MPI job, I would want four of the processes to go on this laptop and four of the processes to go on that laptop. But if I get my launch syntax wrong, all eight processes might go on this laptop and none on this one, not what I want. And so, um, and so, um, someone's asked a question, I'll come back to that. Uh, and so, what you can actually be useful to know what is the name of the machine I'm running on now? It's an unfortunate um, naming uh, MPI name. MPI was defined before we had multi core processors. So, MPI, the core is called MPI get processor name. Actually, it would be better to be called MPI get node name or MPI get computer name, but it gives you back the name of, you know, this might be called David's laptop. It gives you back a character string which tells you what the name of the machine are running on. And that can be useful to give you confidence that your processes are running where you think they're running. So it's just a useful thing to do. MPI get processor name in C and Fortran. It's the, support. It's the same, um, same prototype. It returns you a string which um, is a size. Um, max size MPI and max process name to some constant, but it can be useful to give you confidence that your program is running what you think. So Ben W asks, is the way to get four to return a rank identifier that starts at one rather than zero? No, because when you when you subsequently um, to ascend or receive, you're ascending to a rank which has to be zero based. Now, if you you can you could go as far as wrapping all the MPI functions so that I. I but no, um, I, let's be honest, MPI is a library written in C, designed by C programmers. So um, basically, for us, for, well, if you're a four hour programmer, you have to basically just, unfortunately, just suck it up. So it, 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 it is annoying, um, but um, um, there is no way to get it to return a, a rank identifier starts at one rather than zero. Um, you get a zero based number. Um, so. So summary, um, we've, so actually I'm, I'm, I'm slightly ahead of myself here because um, um, because I've done some of the stuff before. We've covered some basic MPI calls. Uh, we can still write useful programs, but we um, we need to compile and launch parallel programs. As I said, this treaty is not specified by MPI. And normally I would go into the lecture and I would talk about what is the compiler calls here and whatever. But actually, um, I've done that lecture slightly out of order. So that's slightly ahead of time, actually. So, so the exercise um, um, is actually to, to write um, a, um, a program which, rather than just printing Hello World, 
actually um, print something more useful. And the three things you might want to print out are from your program. One is um, uh, who you are. Hello, I am rank north one two three four. The second thing is you might want to print out how many processes there are. Hello, there are a total number of so many processes. And the third thing you might want to do is to um, print out what the machine name you're on, which is to call MPI uh, get processor name. Those are three sort of useful bank. Well, two of them are essential. The rank and the size are essential in any MPI program. Getting this processor name is a useful diagnostic. So this was sorry, this is in another lecture. Uh, I've talked about Fortran and C. What about C++ program as well? MPI is not an O interface, but you can be called from C++. So MPI is a C library effectively, but the interface between C++ and C is well defined. So if you're a C++ programmer, you should call the MPI functions as if they were C functions. They used to support an OO interface. They used to support an interface which was like this, where uh, I'm not a, 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 a very good OO programmer, but um, the, the, um, the methods, the, the MPI calls were methods on an object, and the object was the communicator. So what you would do is you would say com equals MPI com world, and to get the rank, instead of MPI um, com rank, you did com dot get rank, and the communicator you were calling on was, in, was implicit as being, because this is the object com, and then size equals com dot get size. That has been deprecated. So that interface no longer, it, it may work, you may get away with it, but it's no longer supported. The, the C++ compiler is called MPI CXX, um, and there's a very simple hello.cc example you can compile. But basically, if you're a C++ programmer, you have to call the MPI functions as if they are C functions. This interface is no longer, um, C++ interface is now removed. You must therefore cross call to, oh, sorry. You must therefore cross call to C. So um, I think it just became too much effort to maintain the C++ interface, uh, and it is now it's deprecated. It, it isn't supported. You may be able to get it to work, but again, I would recommend that you just call, if you're a C++ programmer, you just call the, the MPI libraries if they were C functions. So if I show you the exercise sheet, um, so you can see here that um, I have the exercise sheet here, which I can click up. So you can see that the first exercise, if I zoom in a bit, is to oops, write an MPI program that prints the question hello world and compile and run on several processes in parallel. We've done that, but we can do. Now modify your program so each process prints out both its rank and the total number of processes P the code is running on. So you've seen examples in the in the slide you call MPI com rank and MPI com size and inquire. What is my rank in MPI com world? Excuse me, this is uh, um, uniquely, um, a unique, this unique global rank. And if you want to know how many, the total number of processes, you ask, what is the size of MPI com world? You call MPI com size. Um, you can rapidly see that um, if you get everyone printing out, you'll get lots of print statements. So modify the programs so that only the master prints out a message. So you need to, um, MPI programs, you don't really want every rank printing a process, print, printing a message because it gets very um, um, messy. And this is just a little exercise. What happens if you omit the final MPI call in your procedure call in your program? Things go wrong. They go wrong in different ways on different systems, but it's worth doing just to see that um, um, you can get strange, um, strange effects when that happens. The exercise I have, uh, extra exercises to use the function MPI get process name to get each rank to the name of the computer that it's running on. Because we're using, if you're using your laptop or the data analytic cluster, you're just on a single login node of your laptop. All the process will be running on the same machine. So if you call MPI get process a name on your laptop, you will just get, they're all running on my laptop, whatever your laptop is called. Um, if you're running on a cluster, you'll have to look up your local documentation. But if you run on multiple nodes, you will be able to see that MPI get processing will give different different um, answers. So some of the ranks will say I'm running on node zero, some will say I'm running on node one, depending on how the nodes, the separate computers in your in your cluster are named. Uh, there is a batch system on the data analytics cluster. We're not going to use it because A, it's not um, particularly um, helpful when you're learning, but B, you can't on the data analytics cluster, you can't actually run an MPI 
program across more than one node. That's because it's been set up for doing data analysis, not for running large parallel programs. So I've left that in, uh, exercise in there, but um, it's not particularly um, it's not particularly exciting. Um, what I will do afterwards is we'll um, go on to the parallel calculation of pi, which is the, the exercise we'll really concentrate on next week. But but for, for the moment, we're just going uh, going through these exercises. It's quite simple, but it really is just to get you writing your, your, your first MPI program, calling those three functions, the two most important ones, MPI con size and MPI con rank, and hopefully the, 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 the code snippets and the slides have shown you how to actually, how to actually call them. Um, I don't know, if, so what do, I'm happy to sit, so I'll probably do that exercise for the next, Maybe um, um, sort of, we've got a bit quicker than I expected. Maybe the next sort of 20 minutes, 25 minutes or so. And what I'll do um, at the end is I'll basically um, on the screen just go through the exercise and show, the, show you the answer, to show you how to program them up and show you, um, just point out some things which may not be, may not be particularly obvious about how they work. So, um, so as I said, I'm slightly ahead of schedule, but my plan was that you would um, work on those exercises for the next, you know, let's say, let's say 25 minutes. So at 25 past, I will come back. I'm sorry, well, I'll be here all the time, but at 25 past, I'll, I'll just show you how those exercises work by doing some programming. And okay, so, um, and then I'll maybe, I probably won't give you any of the extra lectures, but I'll talk a bit about the extra exercises, probably finish early today. Um, so, uh, sorry, she's asked when do we use different MPI con world. So, I've got a lecture which touched, so the lecture which discusses that is, um, whoops, is a lecture next week called Communicators, Tags, and Modes. But for example, when you use different con world, they're used for a number of different, um, different um, uh, reasons. But one, I talked about reduction operations. So um, a reduction operation takes um, lots of processes and, and let's say let's say adds up all the uh, lots of different numbers. If you pass MPI com world to a reduction operation, the reduction will take across will take place across that entire communicator. So it will take take place across um, the entirety of, 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 of all the processes. But imagine you wanted that reduction operation to only take place across the odd communicator, the odd processes or the even processes. There is no MPI function which says, do this reduction operation across all the odd processes, do this reduction operation across all the even processes. What you do in MPI is you create a new communicator, a sub-communicator, which, which only contains the odd processes, or only contains the even processes, and then pass that to, to, to MPI. So anytime you want something to take place on a subset of processes, um, you use communicators. The other point is you might, you might very early on split, you might say, well, I've got 100 processes, I want the 50 of them to do this thing, and 50 of them to do something completely different. Then you would create different communicators for the first process, the first 50 processes, and the second 50 processes, they will be in different communicators, and they will be completely ring-fenced from each other. If they're doing point-to-point -point communication, the point-to-point -point communication will be ring-fenced within their sub-communicators. So, um, a lot of people, I come back to this next week, never use this functionality um, of, of playing around the communicators. You will see a lot of programs that only ever use MPI con well, but it's there for generality. I don't know if that helps. So there are a whole set of communicator manipulation functions which allow you to do all these things which will not really cover any of them. I need to mention one of them in this short version. Um, there's a whole chapter in the standard on communicator management, which includes all these, all these, um, um, all this, this, this functionality. If you go to the training again, training main training page, as you pass program with MPI, this is the one. It should be uh, yes. It's not particularly obvious, but it's there. It's, it's under week one time table. I stuffed it in. Here's the exercise sheet. So it's just the first thing under the week one. Um, okay, cheers. So I said the idea there is to use the information from this um, from this lecture to in, just do some real MPI calls, not just so the, the default. These templates just have to have MPI in the MPI final. You want to call com rank, com size, 
and optionally this um, um, uh, get process name. So what I'll do, I've just had a suggestion from Claire, which is a good one, is I will go back um, and just remind you how to um, how to compile um, So here's my, um, I'm logging into the NIDF, on my Fortune account. I had to do that um, module switch open MPI. For module unload GCC for technical reasons, unfortunately. So, um, as I said, um, I, uh, I, I'm assuming I've already created the, um, the hello.c um, There's my hello.c file, which I can either have got using wget or curl, or I could have edited it. But the useful command, if you're not particularly used to the command line, if you, um, ls is for listing files. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, I have to do better un un unhelpful coloring going on here. ls lists my files, so I've got hello, hello.c, hello.f90, and some other uh, rubbish lying around. ls minus l is useful because it gives you some information on, on when they were created and their length. So you can see that. Um, uh, that um, crazy hello.c at part two, but the hello program itself will be compiled to half three. And um, there are some, these are some backup files which have been created by the compiler, so I'll be fine. But just to remind you, having done those um, those two module commands which are on the, on the slides, uh, I can just use MPI CC minus o hello hello.f90. Ah, okay, so I was playing around. Um, I'll do two things wrong there. MPI see my hello, hello doxy. Sorry, I'm bit, I, was, I was mixing my languages up there. And then I can just run it. If I just run it, I get one process, hello world. But if I MPI run it, minus M3, I get three. So having set up the correct modules, which you won't have to do on your laptop, but you do for, fortunately, for technical reasons, you have to do on, on the data analytics cluster. API CC minus oh hello hello dot C compiles the program. You can just run it as a normal program which runs a single process. What's more interesting is MPI run it. But the problem here is one of these print statements was from rank zero, one was from rank one, and one was from rank two. We don't know which, and that's what the exercise is. For Fortran, I was playing around with the, with the Fortran one. Um, we have, yeah, Fortran, we do use MPI. The, the more modern interface isn't quite configured correctly. But if we, that's the default Fortran, hello.f90, and I'm going to do mpf90 minus o hello, hello.f90. Same thing, I can now run the version, which is exactly the same, except I get the space in front of the print statement. I can run, I can run, run and m4 hello, and for hello world. So, so, um, I should maybe, the, I just checked that the, the C++ version works as well. I haven't got that, I will probably get it. Hello.cc. It's just the same, except it does. Um, I have to include the IO and I have to do, I do C out instead of printf. I'll just check that it actually works. MPIC XX. And oh, hello. Hello.c. And that works. Can we have a runtime? Pen. So, so, so those are just at the box. They can run. 
in parallel, but um, without the without the inquiry functions and um, comp rank, comp size, they're not particularly useful. If we want to do something useful with this program, um, sorry, sorry, I was muted there. Apologies. Um, we want to create a couple of variables, rank and size, because we want to find out what our rank is and what our size is. So I create business integer variables, but I ask it. I have to ask after initializing MPI. I have to ask MPI how many processes are in MPI com world. I do that by calling MPI com size and saying what is the size of MPI com world, which is synonymous with how many processes is the program running on. And the second thing I said is, what is my rank within Commonwealth? I'll get no unique number there. Then I can print hello world from rank, whatever, out of whatever, and I'll print something useful. So probably there was muted before, and that's my fault. If I now CC it and compile it, I can now run it, Control 4. I get something more useful. Ah, so I've just um, done something really, really stupid. So what have I done wrong? Um, so I, I got my uh, brackets in the wrong place. So I, I screwed up the print statement there. So I've got problems for that. If I run See, hello from rank zero out of a total of four. So, so first of all, we now know this print statement came from rank zero, this came from rank one, this came from rank two, this came from rank three. And they all, so they got a unique rank out of a total of four. If I ran on, for example, seven, I would get something different. Now the ranks are not one, two, three, four, five, six, out of a total of seven, okay? So it, it seems, it might seem a bit strange, but basically when you run an MPI program, you launch on a certain number of processes here, seven. You have to inquire from within the MPI program how many of us are there. So that's where you get the seven. And this is comp size, this is comp rank. The other interesting thing is you might be tempted to believe that this meant that rank six ran before rank zero. The, the all of the print statements come to the screen has got no bearing on reality. All these processes are printing to the same screen, and the I/O system will mess them up. So. From an individual process, the, the, the prints will, will appear in order. So all the prints from rank zero will appear in order, the prints from rank one will appear in order. But they can be messed up in any way, and the order isn't particularly significant. So if I run this again, you'll see that appeared to have rank zero running last, and now I run it again, rank zero appeared to run first. That does not correlate to what order they actually ran in time, because who knows what happens between the print statements being issued and them appearing on the screen. Um, the other thing you want, might say is, well, if I'm going to run this on lots and lots of processes, I'm going to get an automatic output. Okay. So what you always do in in MPI is you protect your print statement. So I, if I only want one process to print this, I would say if rank equals zero. So this is just a, this is just a normal print statement. There's nothing magic about this. Every process executes this, this if. It just happens to be that rank is only zero on one of the processes. So n minus one of the processes say if rank equals zero, rank is not equal to zero. I just skip to here, but one of them does this. So now when we run this, we'll only get one print statement. So in MPI, you almost always enclose your print statements with if rank equals zero. Um, now, there's nothing special about rank zero. It's conventional to pick rank zero as the as the um, the controller, but there is always a rank zero. Even if you run on one process, there's a rank zero. So, so that's why it's a sensible thing to do. But internally within MPI, there is nothing special about rank zero. So if I now compile again and run again, I just get one hello world from rank zero out of a total of 17. So that's a way of controlling the print statements. Uh, if I want to print the um, the node, I have to declare uh, node name a parameter string. For some reason, I have a length, and I have to call. 
call, that's not called MPI get processor name of um, its node name. It also gives you the language in C, its name, which isn't particularly relevant in C. So then we print F Frank sent he is on node. Another name, so it's a print time. So this is each process inquiring what's the name of the computer I'm running on. So if I do recompile, we run, we see that that um, I've screwed this up again, and I seem to be. It's a string, not a character. Apologies about that. So all of these um, processes are running on a computer called RDF Com NSO, which is just the login node. So I mean, basically, um, because I'm running on this, this this shared machine here, all the processes are just on the same machine. On a real cluster, though, they would be distributed all over the place. So for example, um, I can just. I can actually switch to a, a, a window I've got pre-prepared on, um, on Archer. Let's just see if this actually works. I'm doing this on the fly, so who knows if it'll work. But if I switch to um, an Archer screen, which does have multiple, um, oh, um, you should now see my Archer screen. Okay, so this is on Archer. And um, I did hello.c. I will try and just do a very naughty way. What I will try and do is on Archer. There we go. So now I, this is on Archer. On Archer, the compiler is called something different, but if we've written this MPI program correctly, it's, what, it's called CC. And the, the launch uh, on Archer is good. So it, it's taking a bit of setup to get this running. So, so that's why we're not running on Archer. But um, I can run this program on 48. What we see is we get a lot of output. But if we make the window bigger, you'll see that now Archer has 24 cores per node. So the low numbers. Um, processes are on node NID 00696, but the high numbered ones are on NID 00722. So as you can see, Archer has um, 24 uh, CPU cores per node. I've run on 48 CPU cores, AP run minus N48. So that's got across two nodes of Archer. Nodes are physically just completely different machines. Think of them as being almost like different laptops. And so the first 24 uh, cores. The first 24 processes, which is ranked 0 to 23, where 23 are on the first node, which is called uh, very unimaginative name NIDS00696. But then 24 and upwards, let's find 24. Um, somewhere in here will be 24. I can't see it, but there's 24 are on a node 702. So on a genuine cluster which has multiple nodes, when you run large programs, they will run on different. And this is this is quite useful to know where your, your CPUs actually are. That was just a bit of a, a play around. I will um, for NPR for, for Fortran, very similar. I will just basically same thing. Integer um, rank comma size. Do call MPI com. I'm capitalizing it the same way, but do have to be of my error. I'll do the same for size. 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 Hello world. 
um, friend. friend. Right. Mkr ninety. Oh, hello. Hello. Ninety. Mkr run. Hello. Get the same thing in Fortran. Uh, we were talking about the. Um, what happens if you miss if you omit uh, MPI finalized? Let's have a look. I haven't actually tested it recently on this. So let's see what we get. Let's comment that out. Fortran, did it print the same as? Let's recompile. So, yeah, so what you get is a non clean exit. Um, so, basically, you see the program ran, but then it basically got upset. Because the runtime system noticed that um, MP rank has actually due to process rank, but, um, and it, but it's basically noticed that there is something something nasty going on. So although the, this is to illustrate your program may or may not run correctly, here it has run correctly, but um, you need to be careful because um, uh, if you don't call MPI finalized, then funny things can happen. Here with a lot of error messages on the end. So you, you do need to call finalized just to make sure that things are, are, are working cleanly. Um, yeah. So um, the well, one other thing that I wanted to uh, mention was basically um, um, look at the C version. Um, I look at the C version, um, then, um, so I'm just having a slight, fine, okay. Uh, the C version, I said that these, uh, I said that the, um, the communicator was this, this kind of, sort of handle. What we can do is here I, be, I verbatim said MPI com world, okay? But I can have a communicator and then see that's a type of cop. So I can do MPI com, com, but that's a, a variable of type MPI com. And I can say com equals MPI com world. And that means I can now replace these with a variable. So if you don't want to, I mean, I've, I've, I've hardwired cold world here. If you want to use a variable, this, this, this code is identical to the previous one. It's not hardwired com world. I've, I've got a variable. But in C, I have to go type MPI com com. And then I just set that com equals MPI com world. And this code is then identical to having verbatim MPI com world. And here we just didn't allow it. Let's just check it if it still works. It's exactly the same as before. In Fortran, at least in Fortran 90 interface, which I'm covering here, sorry, F9. Um, if you want to do the same thing, they're not typed, they just don't type integer. So you would do it. That'll be the same thing. So although you can hardwire com world in there, if you want to assign it to a variable, you can define the variable. And the important point is in C, where these handles are type def, it's of type MPI com, which is a some sort of defining what type that is defined in the header file. In Fortran, at least the Fortran 90 interface that I'm teaching here, they're just integers. So again, you don't um, but you know, we'll not do any, we'll not play around with communicators in this course, but I just thought I should use that as a way of illustrating how it works. So, I mean, um, I don't know if I claim it's ahead of schedule, but it was the first. I left a lot of slack in case there were any um, terrible issues with the technology. Um, I think um, that everything I really wanted to cover, if I go back to the timetable, um, yeah, that's really. So, so we've written an MPI program, which basically um, you know, initializes MPI. Works out who we are, does a few print statements, a bit of more bookkeeping, and finalizes. But what we've not actually done is is actually exchange any messages. We've not actually done send and receive. 
So we'll do that um, next week, where we'll basically, within here, knowing our size and our rank, we can then decide, well, I want to send a message to this person and that person, that, that other process after the receive. Um, so again, it's not quite as simple as you might might think. There are some subtleties to it, but we'll cover that next week. I think we might as well just um, finish now. This is the natural break and um, come back next week for point-to-point -point communication. And the example, okay, I wanted to cover one final thing, actually. So the exercise, um, if I can share the right screen. The exercise, which is in the exercise sheet here, I might as well introduce it here. So we've done all of this stuff, and I've played around with the pet processing. What we're going to do is, the, the main exercise is to, um, is to do a parallel calculation of pi. This is a completely straight standard exercise that people do. But it turns out that an approximation of the value of pi can be found with this expression. Pi by four is, is actually the integral of um, one over one plus x squared, which is arc tan um, x. But we can represent this very naively as this sum. This is a very, very simple representation of this integral. I've just split the area up into the curves of lots of little blocks of, um, uh, of width 1 upon n and, and, and height the, um, the, the, the value of the function. So I've just, I've just done the most naive thing of, of, of filling it with lots of, of, of um, representing this integral as, as a sum. So for reasonable large values of n, you get a reasonably approximate value of pi. If you look at this expansion, though, this is a clear um, thing which can be done in parallel. So for example, if I put n equals 840 here, and I had two processes, I could have the first process, process 0, summing up the terms 0 to 8, uh, 0 to 419, or, 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 or let's say 1 to 420, sorry. And the second process, doing the other subset of, of summations from 421 to 840. So what I want to do is sum up all these numbers, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to split it up onto the process because summation is associative. I can, um, I can have different processes computing different um, sections of the sum. So to do the final thing, which is then to add those together, we're going to use point-to-point -point send receive to send them all to some um, work, some um, controller process to add them up. But actually, even without knowing about send receive, you can do the first two parts of this exercise you just modify your hello world so each process independently computes the value of pi and prints it to the screen. You should check the values are correct. So make sure it is easy to get this expression wrong, especially for a C programmer. This sum does go from 1 to n, not from 0 to n minus 1. Uh, that does go from 1 to n. But if you use the value of n of 840, you should get a reasonable value of pi, like 3.141.5927 or something like that. Um, but then the next thing is you want to split this, this, this summation up. And to split it up, you need to know the rank and the size. Okay? Why do you need to know both? Well, you need to know the size to know what size, the, how big the chunks are. So if n is 840 and size is 2, then the chunks are of size 420. If n is 840 and you run on three processes, size is 3, the chunks will be of size um, uh, what's that, 280. So you need to know the size to work out how big each chunk is, but you need to know your rank to know which chunk you're doing. So if, if, if size is three, we've got three chunks, but we want rank zero to do one to 206, uh, 280, rank one to do 281 to 560, and rank two to do 561 to 840. So what you can do is, this illustrates splitting up Splitting on communicate, splitting on a computation of different parts based on the value of your size and your rank. And you will be able to do that here. So you will then be able to print out rank zero's contribution is this, rank one's contribution is that, rank two's contribution is that. And you can add them up the calculator to check you get the right answer. What you can't do is the third bit because you haven't talked about send and receive yet. But you know enough to play around with the, the, this part here, the, second, the first two parts of the calculation at the end page one of the sheet, you already know enough from just extending the Hello program to be able to, to, to do that. The other thing I'd say is that shortly after this finishes, we will put a video up on the, um, we'll link a video in of the entire session from week one. It takes a little while for the video to be produced and Claire has to do some post-processing. 
but hopefully, you know, in, the, in a couple of days, I hope we would have the video up. So if you want to revise any of it, the slides will already be there. If you want to revise any of it, looking at the programming session, that should be up within a day or so. So if you're keen, that would be really good if before we start next week, you've tried parts one and two of this, where each process independently computes its contribution to pi, but you won't be able to add them together because we haven't covered send and receive yet, but we'll cover those next week. So unless there are any other questions, um, if you recently applied for an account and haven't got, um, so Claire says we put up solutions to the exercises too. They are actually up there. So if you look, um, I have already, sorry, I've got the wrong. There are, um, as I say here, although it's always best to try and write the right answer to the exercise, here's a tar file containing simple solutions. They are very, very simple solutions, but what you would do if you copy this, and I should maybe show you how to um, deal with the tar file. So what I'll do is I'll copy the link address. I will now show you my, um, I should be now back in my, um, here I'm back in my, my window on the DAC. I will use wget that address. But now if I do LF minus L, you'll see that I have this file MPP solutions.tar. But if you're not familiar with tar files, that's that the package I can I can um, unpack with tar minus XVF MPP solutions. But that, that says X is extract, V is robot, and F tells it the file name. And you'll see it pro there's now a whole bunch of, of um, if I go to MPP solutions, you'll see there's a C and a fourth time directory. If I go to the fourth time directory, there's solutions to the, as I said, the hello world, the pi, the ping pong, the rotate, collect. Some of these we won't be covering this in this thing, but there's solutions to all of the exercises, most of the exercises in the sheet there. They're very simple. Um, the pi solution is very, uh, the pi example is actually quite um, a, um, a surprisingly illustrative example despite the simplicity. And so I have actually, if you see, um, put up, um, I thought I had put up, yes, I have put up the Pi solution. I will cover it on week three, but um, uh, there I've put up a fairly, so, so in, these, in, the, in the bundle of solutions in general, the Pi solution is quite, quite terse. I have written a much more verbose one, which is in this Pi solution. Again, I recommend you have a batch of doing it yourself before looking at the solution. If you want to look at the Pi example in great, um, in all its gory detail, I put up a solution there in week three. So um, I thought it was such an important example. I give a much more verbose solution to it. So, okay, thanks everyone. I hope you found that useful. Um, and I just seem to have one. I think I've seen all the comments. So hopefully see you again. If you've applied for an, an account on the DAC, it will come through in the next day or so. So you'll have plenty of time to, to work on the exams before we get back to the next week. Next week we'll talk about the, the point to point communication and a bit more about communicators, tags and modes, some technicalities of point to point communication. And the key example for next week is this, this PI example, which is um, again, quite straightforward to understand, but surprisingly illustrative of a real MPI program. So, I'll log off now and uh, I should maybe stop the recording. Stop the recording and so nice to speak to you all next week. Thank you for attending and um, hope you get a chance to work on the exercises in the intervening time, either on your laptop or on the back. Okay, bye.